Now that we've wrapped up the discussion of factory methods in the Java Completable Futures API, let's turn our attention to completion stage methods. And you'll see that there's a couple of different, there's actually many different parts to completion stage methods. So we're going to break this discussion up into several subsections. In general, completion stage methods chain together actions, which are known as dependent actions, to perform asynchronous result processing and to compose together results when one or more previous stages finish. So let's talk about how you can chain actions together using completion stage methods. So a completable future can serve as a completion stage for asynchronous result processing. And let's take a look and see how that plays out in practice. The basic idea is that what's known as a dependent action runs when a previously invoked asynchronous call completes and returns a result. This is a bit of a mouthful to say, but a dependent action runs on a completed async call result. I could probably phrase that a little bit better, but the basic idea is when a previous asynchronous call finishes, then a dependent action can be triggered to handle the results of that previous asynchronous stage. That's what it's really trying to say. And as usual, we'll take a look at an example in the EX8 project in my Java 8 folder in my Live Lessons GitHub repository. So this particular example will start out by creating an unreduced big fraction. So recall that you can have reduced big fractions and unreduced big fractions. So an unreduced big fraction is just going to have this value, the first big integer, as the numerator, and this value, the second big integer as the denominator, and we pass in the value false that says don't reduce. Why we're doing that are two reasons. Number one, just do something interesting in the background, but also reduction can take a while, so we might not want to run that in the calling thread. What we then do is we go ahead and make ourselves a supplier lambda variable. We don't have to do this, but you'll see that by doing it, it cleans up the code that comes afterwards. And this supplier lambda, when called, will take the unreduced big fraction and reduce it. And we're, of course, going to do this off of the main thread of control in order to more effectively uh, leverage multi-core processing. We then say supply sync reduce. Supply sync is the factor method we've been talking about. We pass in the reduce supplier lambda and or supplier variable, which is a supplier lambda. And that will then schedule this supplier to run in the background in the common fork join pool somewhere in one of those threads and it will return a completable future. But the computation is still taking place in the background. So then what we do is we chain a dependent action, which is this big fraction to mix string method reference. We chain that and tell it to run, or more specifically we say, hey, com hey, completable futures framework, please run this dependent action when the completable future returned from supply async finishes so that this computation can be performed. And you'll notice one of the cool things about this is that this particular approach is looking visually like synchronous programming. This thing happens, or rather, this thing happens, then this thing happens. But in fact, it's running asynchronously in the background. That's one of the beauties of the Computable Futures framework. It gives you this cool ability to combine what looks like synchronous fluent programming with an asynchronous execution model. And then just to take this to the next step, we're chaining yet other actions, other operations fluently. So the then accept method, which is a completion stage method, of course, is being used to say when then apply finishes converting the reduced big fraction to a mixed string, then run this dependent action which is to print the result to the standard output. So again, you can see this very cool little chain of operations. So basically what's happening here is that each of these actions, reduce, big fraction to mix string, system out, print lin, and so on, those are being registered with the completable futures framework to be invoked at the appropriate point in time. 
And the lambda action is only called after the corresponding previous stage in this chain completes successfully. I haven't talked about error handling yet. Don't worry, we'll get to it. But this particular example is assuming sunny days, fair winds, following seas, everything's going well. If it doesn't go well, we'll look at that later and talk about exception handling mechanisms. And this is basically what's meant by chaining. So we're chaining these things together. And again, that should look very familiar to the way we program in Java parallel streams or Java streams, except these calls are taking place asynchronously. And in particular, these actions are deferred until the previous stage completes and a fork join thread is available. Now, this particular approach is very likely to have each of these stages run in the same thread of control that originally ran the reduce action that was passed to supply a sync. It would be very unusual if that was not the case. We'll see later there's other ways of saying to run these things in different threads. It's pretty cool too. So the long and the short of it is that fluent chaining enables async programming to look like synchronous programming. And that is indeed what it does. And I think that's a really cool feature and greatly simplifies the, the inherent and accidental complexities of dealing with asynchrony. And this also avoids some of the nasty problems we talked about earlier to, that we discussed having to do with callback hell. So having these dependent actions that are triggered avoids the problems with callback hell and deeply nested asynchronous exception processing. So that's the end of part one, this should say part one, not part two, of this particular example.